I believe the Lord has something special for you this morning. If you have your Bibles, if you could open them up to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. Continue to keep our pastors in prayer. How many love our pastors? Continue to keep them in prayer. They are in the Holy Land. And uh, they're, co- they're going to be coming back this week. But man, it's, it's just so awesome just to see, uh, you know, what God is doing right there. And, you know, just, you know, I, I just can't wait just to hear the reports of what's taking place. Right here in 1 Samuel chapter 17, this morning, I really believe that the Lord has a word for each and every one of you and also for your family. The Bible says right here in 1 Samuel chapter 17, right here in verse 2, it says, Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley. Somebody say the valley. And they drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. And the Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley in between them. But a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span, which is about nine feet. Let's go down to verse 48. It says, as the Philistines moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck that Philistine in the forehead. Come on, somebody. And the stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with the sling and with the stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and he killed him. Father, we just thank you this morning for your word. We thank you this morning for your presence that is in this place. We just want to give you the glory. But we also pray, God, that your word will fall on good soil and produce. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. We all say amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. The title of today's message is Victory in the Valleys. Victory in the Valleys. You know, victory isn't just something that we experience on the battlefield. But victory is an attitude. Victory is a mindset. You know, this was one of Israel's challenges for a long time. There would be periods in Israel's journey where they were victorious. And other times where they were defeated. One of the most critical periods for the nation of Israel was when they came out of slavery. This is so important to understand because you got to understand when they came out of slavery, they had no law. They had no instruction. As a matter of fact, they used to live their faith according to the faith of their forefathers, of those that have gone before them, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. So they had no law, they had no instruction. So when they came out of slavery, they, you know, they came out with the mindset of, of, of like being reintroduced to God for the very first time. When they came out of slavery, they met God, the deliverer. How many thank God that he is a deliverer? Come on, how many thank God that he's delivered us? Whether you were the rebellious, or whether you were, the, you were the religious, how many thank God that he delivered us this morning? But then in the wilderness, for 40 years, they met God as their provider. He would provide direction. He would even provide them manna. He would provide them something to eat. For 40 years, they experienced the, the pure provision of God directly from heaven. They experienced God as their provider. But then when they went into the promised land, they experienced the faithfulness of God. How many thank God that he's faithful to his promises? He's a faithful God. But then on the battlefield, 
They started fighting, fighting the Canaanites. They started fighting the different tribes right here in the land of, of Canaan. They started fighting the Philistines. And, and, and on the battlefield, they began to experience the almighty God. They met the almighty God that even though some battles were lopsided and some battles were unfair, that, that God was still with them and God was giving them the victory. That's why victory is an attitude. Victory is a mindset. Victory is a mentality. But despite how great God was, the people still wanted to take matters into their own hands. They told the prophet Samuel, they went to Samuel and they said, Samuel, we want a king just like everybody else. The world has a king. The world has a monarchy. So we want a king. We want to be like everybody else. And, and Samuel went to the Lord with, with such a heavy heart. And he went to God. And he said, God, what do you want me to tell them? God, what do you want me to do? And God said this. He said, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. They're not rejecting you as their leader. They are rejecting me as their king. And he told them, he said, just give them what they want, but warn them, but warn them, warn them that they're going to go from being sons and daughters of the most high king to just being subjects and servants of an earthly king. He said, make sure you warn them. And this is why when they were in the valley, and this is why when Goliath came out, Goliath began to shout. And he began to tell them, I am the Philistine champion, and you are only the servants of Saul. Wow. That is the biggest insult he could have gave them. He goes, I'm a champion. All you are is just servants. But how many know God was raising up a giant killer? <laughs> Come on, how many know in the shepherd field the Bethlehem a, a young shepherd boy God was raising him up God was raising up a giant killer and as I look out this morning I believe God is raising up some giant killers I believe God is raising up some powerful men and women of God that are ready to slay some giants in this place what we begin to see when you begin to look at the life of David when David encountered Saul, when David encountered the Philistine, David had a mindset of a victor. He was a man of action. See, he was not only a shepherd, but he was a warrior. King David's journey was a journey of victory. From the small victories to great ones. From defeating the bear and the lion in the shepherd's field to defeating giants in the battlefield. From being overlooked. From being overlooked by those closest to him to being noticed by the high priest and by God himself. How I many know oh, God sees you in your secret place? God sees you in that prayer closet. God sees you when you're alone and when you're passing the, the test of integrity, when you're, when you're all alone and you're passing the, the different tests that come your way. I bet David was in the, in the shepherd's field, sometimes feeling lonely, sometimes feeling overlooked. But how many know that God was preparing a giant killer? God was preparing a victor. God was preparing a king. But before we can experience victory on the mountaintop, we must first go through the valley. Before we can get to the mountain, we must first go through the valley. Did you know that the greatest army in the world was birthed in a valley? In 1776... When America signed the Declaration of Independence, that was their mountaintop experience. As they were there in Pennsylvania, as they were there in the Pennsylvania State House, in Philadelphia, they were signing that declaration. 
of independence. It was a celebration. It was a mountaintop experience. But not even a year later, the British attacked and they occupied the capital of Philadelphia. This caused General George Washington and his troops to retreat to a place called Valley Forged. When they first arrived to the valley, the army was defeated. The army was tired. The army was hungry. They had low energy. They had almost no supplies left. And because it was the middle of winter, they ended up losing more men to diseases than any single battle. But despite all the hardship, they began to regroup. They began to retrain they be causing them to actually come out stronger and more equipped than ever before. And this allowed them to endure five more years of battles and ultimately winning the Revolutionary War, thus making Valley Forge the birthplace of the American army. Great things come out of the valley. Victory comes out of the valley. How I many know giant killers come out of the valley? There is victory in the valley. The first time David encountered Goliath, they were in the Elah Valley. And what were some of the things that David experienced? Well, the first experience he had was with people. As soon as he showed up to the valley, the people were in fear. The Bible says the people were in great fear. But the first group of people that he encountered were his brothers he came to bring them lunch good old David right he came to bring them lunch just being obedient to his father he came and was doing something good but but the first group of people that he experienced he experienced the envious his brothers were, 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 were starting to become envious of David. David just came to bring them lunch. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that his oldest brother burned with anger against David. David even replied and said, what am I doing? He said, what am I doing? I'm just bringing you some lunch, brother. The first group of people that he experienced in the valley were the envious. The second group of people he experienced in the valley was the enemy. When you're at your lowest, when you're at your lowest, that's why the Bible says that, that, that when Goliath would come out, that they would tremble with, with great fear. How many know that the enemy tries to bring fear into our lives? When we're at our lowest point, he tries to bring fear. But how many thank God that faith will always overcome fear? When faith will arise, it will overtake your fear. And the enemy was trying to bring fear. As a matter of fact, there was great fear at the time. He encountered the envious, he encountered the enemy, but also he encountered an encourager. An encourager. As a matter of fact, King Saul was his encourager. King Saul told David, he said, go and may the Lord be with you. How many know all you need is an encouragement from the king? All you need is encouragement from the king of kings. All we need is encouragement because if the king is for you, who can be against you? All you need is the king on your side. All you need is the king there encouraging your life because how many know we are on the right side? The Bible has to do with the king, a kingdom, but the king's kids. The king's sons and the king's daughters. And, and how many know this is important for, to have the mindset of victory, to know that we're fighting on the right side. God's plan is not just to have sub, sub, subjects, it's not just to have servants, but you and I are sons and daughters of the king. God has given us rulership. We're rulers. Tell your neighbor, you're a ruler. You're a ruler. On this earth, you are a ruler. He is the owner, but we are the rulers. Now, we can rule over a little bit or we can rule over much. 
But how many know God is preparing us for something bigger? God is preparing us for something greater. That's what the Bible said. Just be faithful with what you have. Just be faithful with the little. Eventually, you'll get the much, but be faithful with what you have. Be faithful with what you're given. All you need is to understand that you are on the right side. You are a son, and you are a daughter of the king. You are the ruler. You are the plan of God. He experienced people in the valley. But also, he not only experienced people, but he experienced power. He experienced power. See, after the prophet Samuel anointed David, the Bible says that the spirit of the Lord was with him. This was just one chapter before this. When he was anointed, when he was anointed, the Bible says the spirit of the Lord was with him. See, even though Israel and David were facing the same giant, the difference was their source of power. David said to that Philistine, just imagine facing somebody that's about nine feet tall. And you're just looking up. As a matter of fact, his armor was full of scales. He almost looked like a serpent, a big, huge serpent. And he had these scales on him. And he had this little armor bearer that was carrying his, his shield. His shield was probably the size of David. And he told this Philistine, he said, well, you, you uncircumcised Philistine. He told this Philistine, he called him out. He said, you come to me with swords and you come to me with spears, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. We have the power. Come on, somebody say, I have the power. This is why we have the Holy Spirit. This is why the, we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is with us. The Holy Spirit is with us. You know, you know, Jesus was a perfect example of this. Jesus walked in the Spirit. Jesus was filled with the Spirit. Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit. The Bible says that by the Spirit of God, he was led to the wilderness to separate. But then after the wilderness, he filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. News about him began to spread. He was our example of walking in the Spirit. Being led by the Spirit, rejoicing in the Spirit. What if there was no Holy Spirit? There would be weakness. There would be no love. People would be losing their mind. But how many thank God that he's not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind? How many thank God that he's given us the, the spirit that we need to overcome, to walk as victors, not as victims? Come on, somebody. This is why David cried out. David cried out and he said at his lowest point, he began to cry out and he began to say, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He knew the importance of walking in the spirit. In our power, we can do some things, but in his power, we can do all things. We have the power. He encountered people. He encountered power. But you know what else he encountered in this valley? He encountered provision. There is provision in the valley. See, the valley took place in the Elah Valley. You can actually visit the Valley of Elah today. But the word Elah means terebinth tree. The terebinth tree is an emblem of peace and prosperity. See, at the driest point, this is what the valley looks like. Imagine being in the valley. The enemy's on one side. Israel's on the other. When you visit the valley, you can actually stand in the middle of the valley. Somebody could be at the top of the mountain, and you could clearly hear what they're saying. I actually, see, I, I seen videos of this where people are in the valley just crying out as if they were uh, Goliath. And people being on the hill, and they could clearly hear what they're saying. But you, did you know that you can also experience provision in the valley? 
I said, provision grows in the valley. If you could show the next picture, what actually takes place is provision actually grows in this valley. Resources actually grow in this valley. At the right season, at the right time. I know some valleys feel dry. I know some valleys feel empty. But I'm here to let you know that at the right time, if you don't give up, at the right time, how many know you shall reap? You shall see the faithfulness of God in the valley. Did you know that just in the Central Valley, just in California Central Valley, there's over 250 crops that grow and it yields a profit of $17 billion a year. Just in our valley, just in California Central Valley, as soon as you get over that grapevine, you start seeing all kinds of things, right? Things like you've never seen before. Provision is in the valley. You can experience the provision of God in the valley. Maybe your finances feel like a valley. Maybe your family right now feels like a valley. Maybe right now your prayer life feels like a valley. Maybe right now your ministry feels like a valley. There is good news. There is provision in the valley. How many received that this morning? That's your word this morning, that God's provision can be found in the valley. See, before we can experience the mountaintop, we must first go through the valley. You don't stay in the valley. Because David said, though I walk through the valley. Not though I camp out at the valley. Not I'm going to stay in the valley. But David understood that you got to just walk through the valley. Get everything you can. Can everything you can get. And begin to walk through that valley in power. Begin to walk through that valley in provision. Begin to walk through that valley and say, I'm ready for my mountaintop. Are you ready for the mountain? I remember the very first time I experienced a mountaintop. This was in Whistler, Canada. For the very first time, and we started going up that mountain. And we were following each other up that mountain. It was real late. It was actually snowing. It was hard to see. But I started seeing how the elevation was increasing. We hit the 2,000 feet mark. We hit the 3,000 feet mark. Usually about the 4,000 feet mark, that's usually like our, our, our tempo, right? That's usually like California style, California tempo. Once you hit Big Bear, you're like 5,000 feet. You're like, okay, I made it. I'm, I'm good. But we started going past it. We went 6,000 feet. We got to 7,000 feet on that mountain. The next day, we went out to hit the ski slopes. You probably heard me share this story, but one of the things that impacted me the most was when we got to the top of the summit. When we got to the very top of the mountain, the, most, the thing that impacted me the most was the fact that we weren't the tallest mountain. As a matter of fact, when we were going up, we were going up with another group of skiers. And they were telling us how what they do is they do helicopter skiing. And they were telling us how they've gone through these different peaks in these Whistler, can in these Whistler mountains. And, and they've gone through different peaks and they jump on a helicopter and it takes them to a high mountain, a high place where the snow is fresh, where there's untread trails. They said there's nothing like that experience. See, it's so important for us to understand that the purpose of getting to the top of a mountain is to understand that there's other mountains that God wants us to conquer. The purpose of you getting up to that mountain is to let you know that God just doesn't want to bless you in this season. God wants to bless you in the next season. The, the purpose to let you know is that God has more. The purpose is not to settle on the mountain. 
Because once you settle on the mountain, you say, I've arrived. Once you settled on the mountain, you say, I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to do my nine to five. I'm good right here. I'm going to, you know, stick to my routine. I'm going to stick to my readiness. But I'm here to let you know that God's plan is more than our, it goes beyond us. God's plan, it's not just for our life, but God's plan is for others. And our job is to go down to the valley and begin to gather God's people, begin to gather God's army and say, hey, we're going up. We're going higher. Let's get that mountain. David not only experienced promotion, I mean, David not only experienced provision, but David also experienced promotion. He understood that it wasn't about himself. He said, who is this enemy? Who is this Philistine that is defying, not me, but the armies of Israel? That is defying my people. How many know sometimes we got to fight for others? How many know sometimes we got to believe for others? I'm here to let you know that when God begins to promote you in the valley, when God begins to take you higher in the valley, it's not just for yourself, but how many know it's for others? I pray that you catch this this morning. David went from the shepherd's field to the king as a, as a servant of the king, as, a, as an armor bearer. He went through this process of even being in a cave, running from the king. But after he defeated Goliath, there was a celebration. The people went from great fear to great celebration. The people went from great fear to great faith. The people went from great fear, from defeat to victory. As a matter of fact, they they right away they started saying, David, they started saying, David, you've killed ten, tens of thousands. Saul has only killed thousands. There was a spirit of victory that filled the nation of Israel. This is why God promotes us. Even though David was an overnight success, it was a while before he became king. How many know there's a process to victory? There's a process to victory. It just doesn't happen overnight because anything that happens overnight can be destroyed overnight. But anything that is built over time, how many know it will take time to break down? As they make their way this morning... See, King Saul was anointed once, but did you know King David was actually anointed three times? The first time David was anointed, it was a secret anointing. Nobody knew. The prophet Samuel was led by the Lord, and he said, I want you to go to the house of Jesse, and right there you're going to find the Lord's anointed, and sure enough, This young man came out of the shepherd's field and he said, that's the one that I chose. That's the one that I'm going to promote. No wonder why his brothers were so envious because his brothers were being overlooked. But the Bible says that the three oldest brothers, they pursued to be under the king, servants of the king, rather than servants of our king. It's so important to understand this because when David was anointed, there was a process. When David was anointed to be king right there in the shepherd's field, later on, it was actually Judah that anointed David the second time. Judah said, you're going to be our king. After many years had passed, After many victories had been won, after many battles had been fought, Judah realized this is our king. And Judah anointed David to be king. But the other 11 tribes, the northern tribes, they began to follow the son of Saul. After King Saul died, they began to follow the the son of Saul. But what does the Bible say? That the house of David grew stronger and the house of Saul grew weaker. 
there was promotion in the valley. There was promotion in the valley. Why? Because David's heart was not just after God, but David's heart was also for the people. David was a man after God's heart. And how many know God's heart is for others? For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. It's all about others at the end of the day. How many know when you are a man after God's own heart, when you are a man after God's agenda, when you are a man after God's plan, you're not just living your life for yourself, but you're living for others. You want to see others win. You want to see others overcome. You want to see others. God promoted David in the valley. Finally, the house of Saul, the 11 tribes realized that's our king. And they all came together as a nation. And all together, for the third time, they anointed David as king. David is mentioned over a thousand times in the Bible. Did you know that David is the most talked about character in the Bible besides Jesus. Till this day, the city of David is still in Israel. And the star of David is their symbol. But why? Because David was a catalyst for victory. Because David left a legacy of victory. Because when they remember David, they said, I can overcome. Because when they thought of David, they said, even though people are against me, and over, even though people are overlooking me, and even though there's envy, or even though there's the enemy, or even though there's problems and there's pressures all around me, how many know that because he did it, we can do it? That's why the Bible is about different men and women that have overcome, so that we can look to them and say, they did it, they overcame. God used their life. God has a plan for them. That's why God has a plan for us. God wants to use us. God wants to use your life. David could kill some giants. David could slay some giants. You can ki kill some giants. You can slay some giants. David experienced promotion. David experienced provision. You can experience provision. You can experience promotion. God's goodness rested upon these different men and women in the word so that you and I can look to and say, they left a legacy of victory. All I got to do is follow the path. All I got to do is follow the footprint. All I got to do is continue to seek God. All I got to do is continue to seek God's plan and purpose and follow God's heart and experience the victory so that we can leave a legacy of victory. What's the last thing? David never lost his praise. David never lost his praise. He gives us the formula for victory. He said, don't look at me. He said, don't look at my circumstance. He said, look at the God. Look at God. Look at my king. Look at the almighty God. Look at the all-powerful God. One of the most powerful psalms that David wrote is in Psalms 34.1. He says, I will praise the Lord no matter what happens. No matter what happens. This morning, I believe God's going to give you your victory back. This morning, I believe God's going to give you victory in the valley. This morning, I believe God is going to strengthen those that need strength. And I believe God's going to promote those that are ready to be promoted. Some of you say, you know what, I've been in the valley too long. This situation or this circumstance, it, it feels like I've been in the valley too long, but I got to get the mindset of David that I'm just going to walk through this valley. I'm going to take my mountain. I'm going to conquer. I'm going to be the head and not the tail because God is a mighty God. God is a powerful God. If he did it then, he can do it now. So this morning, if that's you, I want you to come. If you say, you know, I'm ready for strength. I'm ready for promotion. I'm ready for power in the valley like never before. I'm ready to experience the provision of God 
like never before. I want you to begin to come from all over this place. Come on, let God strengthen you.